guys have a study guide that I'm sure you've already printed out, but just in case you haven't, I'm printing it out for you. And so we're just going to go through this. I'm going to tell you the stories that are associated with the keywords and the events. Today, if we are good, because we have today, we have Wednesday, we have next Monday to do everything, which frankly is not a lot of time. So we will hopefully get through the entire first column. And I'll explain the stories. We're going to do it topically. Now, this is extremely important. I mentioned this before. The key part of this unit is cultural literacy. It's not really about telling the story, knowing the story perfectly, but you do need to understand the concepts. It's really important because you have people that were alive for most of this period. And when they make reference to something, you, you need to know what it is that they're talking about. And so I'm going to go through to make sure that you understand the kind of stories that are associated with these events, but you've got to stop me if I'm going too quick. You've got to stop me if you don't understand something. This is really, really critical. So you're on the ball, you're alert, you're taking notes, but you also are stopping me if I'm going too fast. Does that make sense? Because the whole goal is you cannot graduate from this class and not know these things. Then people will say, you took a history class and you didn't know about Cuban Missile Crisis. If, if, if they ever say that, just don't tell them who you took the class from. OK, sorry. let's go ahead. Let's do the, um, looking at this first column, are there any natural divisions? Like if you were to group them together, tell me what they are. The answer, of course, to that is yes. But then your job is to tell me what they are. Um, there's civil rights. And yes. And there's Russia after the Cold War. Yes, absolutely. And there's the um, Nixon. There's a bunch of stuff on Nixon. Yes. So we're going to go here. 45 to 4, that's where we're going to start our story. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this baby boomer, and we already talked a little bit about the baby boomers, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I want to make sure that this isn't one of those words that you've heard every single day and that you didn't actually know what it meant, right? Okay, these are, it's very common that this happens. The baby boom is everybody went off to the war. We're dealing with a huge mobilization. Whether they're fighting directly or if they're in a supply depot, it doesn't matter. You are kind of at risk. You come back and you want to start your life. The baby boomer, for the most part, begins 1944, right as the war was ending. You could push it back to 43 and 42. doesn't matter. Probably is more likely. But this is when the numbers really start to increase. We see a 25% increase in births beginning in 1944, and this increase continues for each successive year. And so for you math majors, 25 increase in 44, a 25% increase in 45, a 25% increase in 46, what does that mean by 1947? 100%. Is it 100%? It, it's actually more than that. Because 25%, so let's just pretend, I don't want to be math here, but let's say 25%, that means 125. 25% of 125 is, you see how that goes? So we're dealing with really a, a massive increase. By the time, and I don't have my math here, what is going to be? That's going to be uh, 25, about 40, right? So here we have 25, we have 40, that would be uh, 165. And then 25% of 165. See that that's 67. You guys are supposed to have better math skills than your history professor, right? So we're looking at what, 230? So we're dealing with a huge increase of population of a very specific group of students, people. So what that means is that if you look at the normal population and you have zero to five, and you have 5 to 10, all right, 10 to 15, these are terrible numbers, 15 to 25, how about that, 5 to 15, 15 to 25, 25 to 35, there's a certain number that you get. With the baby boom, you get this huge 
bubble. Five, zero to five, zero to 10. And because it's kind of fixed in a small window, roughly from 44, I would say that you begin to see this taper off at about 54. It's about a 10 year window. That means that this bubble just moves over time. So after 10 years, you've got this huge bubble of kids zero to 10, right? After 20 years, you've got this huge bubble 10 to 20. It just keeps moving. So today, it's been how many years since 44 math majors? Math majors. 73, right? So nearly 75 years. So that means that right now, we have a huge bubble basically from zero, I'm sorry, this is not working, from 70 to 80 is where our big bubble is, which is again why we have the dependence commercials and the erectile dysfunction and everything else related to old folks, okay? So that's the baby boomers, no question about this, right? So what we were talking about last class is that because this generation is sharing many of the same characteristics it does influence history, World War II, to the present. You don't have a similar generation like this. We have names for them because we have like this thing about naming things. What's the name? What are the kids of the baby boomers called? Just imagine, how old do they have to be in order to start having kids? I mean, they, I guess they could be 12, but realistic, most people, how old are they going to be? in their 20s, early 20s, okay? So you're looking at probably somewhere between 18 and 25, so you're looking at about, what, 18, 20 years, you're looking at 62 to 64. My parents got married in 62. So theoretically, you'd think that the next generation ought to be from say 62 to 72, but it didn't work that way. Why not? And you guys are really smart. Why doesn't it work that way? What's the name of them, by the way? You get, we have names for everything, right? So what's the name of the baby boomers' kids? Gen X. That's right. Generation X, right? When I was in high school, I was called Generation X. But I was not the same type of a generation as a baby boomer. Why not? This is totally easy. You guys can understand this plain language, human stuff. Yes, the reason why the baby boomers were so huge is that the war ends roughly the same time. Everybody experiences the same end of the war. And keep in mind, not just Americans, French, Germans, English, right? It's, it's a world war. The whole world experiences it. So you see this kind of demographic everywhere. What's happening in the 60s? Not quite yet. It's going to be in the 70s. <laughs> but yeah, nothing. You don't have the same thing. Not to mention, you guys don't know this, but 1959, they produced the first oral contraceptive. What is a contraceptive? I wrote a book on this. Five year birth control, right? They've had birth control for a long time. But an oral contraceptive means that you can take a contraceptive without even paying attention to it. You just take it like you take aspirin. So and so it had a huge impact on our, well, it, it became tied to the feminist. It wasn't at first, but it became tied to the feminist movement by the 1970s. But what that did is it totally affected our population growth. I mean, hugely. And so you don't have kids having kids at 18. You don't really often have them at 20 or 25, sometimes you do. You just look at your own families. Do you guys have siblings that have kids? Some of them might be 18, right? Some of them might be 25. My first child, how old was I? It's a good question. 2001, I was 32. 32, not for lack of trying, but 32, right? it's late. So if we range anywhere from 18 to 32, and I have friends of mine, fairly recently, that were pregnant and they were 40. My dad had me when he was 43 something. 
43, I have a uh, high school uh, friend. She was the very first girlfriend that I ever had. I held her hand. She had a child at 42, and that was her first child. So what does that do with the whole generation thing? <laughs> it's just, it's gone. And in fact, there is no like real generation anymore. Because thankfully, just to say this, thankfully we don't have World War III. We got World War II, that fixes it, and after that, it just kind of moves. Nevertheless, we still like to name things, uh, uh, name, label things, so we have Generation X, and then whose are the kids of Generation X? Yeah, well, it would make sense, but we actually gave them a different name. <laughs> kind of. No. You guys are the kids, right? Millennials. Millennials, right. Millennials. Okay. Sometimes we call them snowflakes, but that's a naughty uh, insult to our poor little millennial folks. And the fact is, um, just like the baby boomers, we're not all hippies. You have to know this. Historically, we're dealing with actually a fairly small minority. Even though you've got, for whatever reason, these 70 and 80 year olds are all stopping around how what they did in the 1960s. The fact is, in the 1960s, they weren't. Most weren't. It was a minority that were these radical types. Okay, same thing with these millennials and the snowflake type of thing. Yes, they are, but I deal with you guys all the time. And you know, most people aren't fitting that stereotype. Most people are actually pretty hardworking. Most people can handle the world. Most people aren't falling down and melting at the first uh, chance. So we get these impressions, but we often get the impressions of a minority and we apply it to the majority. And I'm using the millennial example to let you recognize what it was like with the baby boomers. They weren't all one group. We think of the baby boomers as the source of the hippies, right? But they were also the same generation that elected Ronald Reagan. They were also a very strong conservative movement. They're just not as vocal, they're not as loud, they weren't in the newspapers. And so when we try to generalize a generation, keep in mind, it's really hard to do that. There are some characteristics. It's important to be aware of it, because the fact of the matter is, when you have this large cohort is kind of going through history. Your marketing, your styles, your fashions will largely be influenced by this cohort. Not necessarily to the left or to the right, but you'll just be influenced. Which is why when you see 6 o'clock news, you've got the pins and, and ED commercials and stuff. It's the age. It's not left or right. It's just that's the age. And they're still out there. Now what happens when they all die? You know, we're getting already, you see a ton of commercials about funeral insurance and caskets and all that type of stuff. But eventually, yeah, you guys know, you know, you die and you get a funeral. You guys have seen these commercials, like they're on every five minutes when you turn on the television. What happens when the baby boomers are dead? It's going to be weird, right? It is weird because we don't have a single generation. You'll have all sorts of little pieces. And so your marketing is already kind of changing up. We're not quite sure how to deal with it. And right now, Madison Avenue, when I say Madison Avenue, who do I mean? You guys are just literacy thing. Madison Avenue is in New York City, and they are responsible for a great number of ad campaigns. And so when you say Madison Avenue, you're talking about basically the ad fashions and advertising in the country, Madison Avenue. And right now, they have a tough time. Because on the one hand, they all want to advertise you because you guys are like the next baby boomers, except you are so small. There's not hardly very many of you. Even though you get the press, there's not very many, and you're not all that consistent. In fact, you range all over the, the, the demographics. Also, we don't have that much good news on it. It's right. And so who, who do you put all your attention to? It's hard today. It was not hard throughout most of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s because you knew who it was. So I'm just saying that just to prepare to understand why some of our focus was focused as it was because you could always guarantee a certain demographic cohort that you can point to. Okay, gotcha, super easy. Who's Dr. Spock? He is blamed, no, not Star Trek. <laughs> and sometimes people don't know Star Trek, which kind of makes me cry, so I say Spock, and you guys have never heard the word. Okay. That's all we have to say. Okay. So, not Star Trek. It comes out ten years before 
Star Trek. <laughs> Dr. Spark wrote this book. In fact, he's still writing books. Now, he's probably dead. I don't know if he's dead or not. But the book is still out. Dr. Spark's book on babies. And now it's the new Dr. Spock's book on babies. Basically, the message here was let your child explore. Huge in the 50s. Good, bad, and different. Any of you guys have siblings, little people? Good. What's that line? Is this good message, bad message, indifferent message? Why is it good? They can experience. They can explore. Okay. Why might it be bad? Because they um, uh, like tend to like not settle down to one career. Like. Yes. The message is not. The message is not set boundaries. In fact, it's the exact opposite, isn't it? Set, not set boundaries. It's let your child explore, define his own boundaries. Now, I'm not saying that this is the truth, but I'm saying it created a bit of controversy later. Not in the 1950s. In the 1950s, people loved it. But later, they look at some of the characteristics of the baby boomers. And one of the things that they say is that they don't have a lot of boundaries. And they're encouraged not to have a lot of boundaries. Now, I'm going to be totally flippant, so please take this with a grain of salt. Don't go home and tell your parents that. I'm making fun of all the baby boomers, because I'm totally not. As I mentioned, the baby boomers are a wide, diverse group. You have radicals, you have conservatives coming out of the very same generation. But here's the flippant response. You get a kid, and you never say no to that kid, what's going to happen to the kid? This is really easy. They're going to be a spoiled brat, right? So what happens if you have an entire generation of people that don't get said no to. <laughs> well, this is the funny thing. The funny thing is he laughed because that's actually a little bit more accurate. You've got people that are making fun of the baby boomers, but the truth of the matter is that the baby boomers usually had lots of siblings. How many of you have lots of siblings? Okay. Are you forced to share when you have lots of siblings? You may not have people saying your boundaries or whatnot, but there are certain like default boundaries that you have to respect. The snowflake thing in the millennials, very real. Not only do we have kind of an indefined generation, but we tend to have very small families. How many of you only have one sibling or no sibling? This wouldn't have been the case 30 years ago. It's much more the case today. Part of it, oral contraceptives, all sorts of stuff. But not only are our generations not really defined by any particular time, but we're also, we don't have a lot of siblings. And so you guys know this. I'm not being mean, so please don't, don't take this too mean. But what happens if you've got an only child? An only child. And, let's even more. You've got an only child and your parents didn't have that child until they were 40 plus. I want all the attention, all the money. <laughs> okay, so we get where this whole snowflake thing is coming from. But remember, not everybody's a snowflake. This is not the baby boomers. The fact of the matter is there's very few only children. You do have some, but very few only children. You get lots of siblings. Lots of kids, and even though we can look at Dr. Spock, we can't really blame Dr. Spock because he's just doing the beginning. What's important here is that let's say you're the baby boomer and you're taught this, but you didn't actually experience it. What happens when you become the parent? The second argument is, is that Dr. Spock had way more influence in the 80s than he did people love to buy their book, but you had an entire culture that was kind of still recognizing the importance of families. Not everybody was working all the time. You'd have a large number of siblings. It's not until you get into the 80s and they say, well, I don't want to be like the 50s, that suddenly these norms begin to change. And Dr. Spock becomes absolutely 
you have people today, and you can go to the library and you can see them, that they're told, never say no to your child. Never say no to your child. You just don't say no. You always kind of redirect it somehow. Give them something else. This is kind of what Dr. Spock was hinting at, but it didn't really get implemented in the 1950s. It does get implemented later. But then again, we don't have the same generations as we did. What does this mean? I'll let you ponder.